Hi, this is Miss Litton, and this is a rainy day lunch. We have lots of guests in the room, and all our guests right now and AP biologists say hi. Hi. All right. So we're going to review Chapter 32, Circulation and Cardiovascular Systems. Um, I want to take this opportunity, though, to touch on this because you had this in your hyperdoc, positive and negative feedback. Did you not have that in your hyperdoc? You did, did you? Yeah. Okay. So which one of these? Right here is about maintaining a steady state. Which one? Negative. Negative feedback is about the steady state. Good, I wanted you to remember that. And here's another one on positive and negative feedback. Could I have whoever you're sitting next to that has the darkest outer attire on? Could you please explain this one right here? Go ahead. Darkest outer attire. I'm sure it's just because your mouths are full. Yeah, the cell membrane is where all the exchange takes place. Um, some organisms do have a circulatory system like us. And if you recall, there were two types of circulatory systems. Do you remember what those two types were? Open and closed. Which one do we have? Closed. Which means that all our blood stays in our blood vessels, right? Open, it could be part of the time in your body, part of the time in vessels oozing through. Um, and there are some organisms that do not have a circulatory system. And that is because they have a large branching gastrovascular cavity, a large external surface area for all of their exchange. You're usually gonna see those kind of organisms in the water. Yeah, in the water. They're very thin. Okay, we then went into a developmental discussion. Do you remember acelomate, pseudocelomate, and coelomate? Okay, if you are coelomated, remember you have an internal cavity completely lined with mesoderm. I heard it whispered back there, mesoderm. Completely lined with mesoderm. The endoderm is gonna line your digestive tube, which is what you're eating right now is going in your digestive tube. If it knocks up against the walls of that, it's touching endoderm. Mesoderm is what your organs came from. There was a cavity inside of there called the coelom, if you're coelomated. Pseudocoelomated, um, it's not completely lined with mesoderm. And acelomated, you do not have that internal body cavity. And that would be so similar to something you would see in a flatworm or platyhelminthes. Um, a round worm would be uh, pseudocelomated, and a segmented worm, or you and I, would be coelomated. When we talked about that, remember we took it a step further when we looked at developmental issues. We talked about protostomes and deuterostomes. Which one are you? You are a deuterostome, and that is because you're sitting on your blastophore right now, right? Remember that? That opening early in development. Okay. So, moving on, we looked at no coelom, we looked planaria, a pseudo -coelom, or uh, acelomated, nematode, coelomated. We also visited echinodermata, and they have that um, water vascular system that's unique to them. Remember, your whole idea is exchange. And ultimately, whether you are single-celled or multi-celled, whether you are on land or in the water, Every cell in your body where that exchange is gonna take place has gotta be in some sort of moisture. Even for us, gas exchange has to take place where our gases have to dissolve in the fluids of our lungs and in order to cross the alveoli in order to get into our blood. So we talked about two kinds of fluids. Blood, as we know it, always stays in vessels. And then we talked about hemolymph, which is basically your idea currently of blood and interstitial fluid. Remember, here was our definition of interstitial fluid. It's basically the fluid that surrounds your cells right now, okay? 
your cells in your tissues. Um, we then looked at a cladogram and looked at differentiation here. And I know this part was a little bit overwhelming, but I wanna use this opportunity to talk about how we said sponges are at the cellular level from here on up, they have tissues, and then you could differentiate between body cavities, whether they were coelomated, and ultimately protostome and deuterostome. So that is a good picture to revisit in your book. I just annotated it out here on the side. So there's lots of different adaptations in order to handle nutrient transfer, waste transfer, and gas exchange. Um, open and closed circulatory system, we already addressed that. Um, the basics of our cardiovascular system, we have a pump. How many chambers are in our pump? Four. Do we allow for mixing of blood? No. no. We have a real high metabolism. We don't have any mixing of blood. We have three kinds of blood vessels. You ought to be able to right now write an essay for me on the three types of blood vessels. Turn to the person next to you, whoever has the lightest shirt, you're going twice because there's, there's three blood vessels. Pick one, then the dark shirt will do one, and then the light shirt. Go ahead. Go what can you say about it? in the vein because it's not under the same pressure. They have, valves. they have valves to keep it going. Who has a larger lumen, arteries or veins? Veins. Veins. Okay. First of all, let's figure out what a lumen is. It's an opening. Like these are your nostrils. Can you flare your lumen? I didn't do that in class. Somehow I feel compelled to do it now. <laughs> See this opening right here? Larger. This one is smaller. Why is that? Why is that an adaptation? Okay, where's the blood moving faster? In arteries. Under greater pressure, I'm moving faster, right? So you can have a larger volume of blood move through the arteries because they're moving more rapidly. The veins are moving more slowly, and so they need to be wider to accommodate the same amount of blood that's in your arteries. Yes? Okay, why does all exchange only occur at a capillary? I have blood running up my neck right here in my carotid artery. Um, why can't I that feed my neck right here? Because this is multicellular, this artery. The only place that I can do exchange is where I have a capillary because it is one cell thick. Now, one cell thick allows for diffusion across the capillary wall and, sure, yeah, walk right in front. Um, and then the two, the tissue fluid, okay? So when we look at the anatomy, when we look at the anatomy here, you can see the artery, here's the capillary is one cell thick, and then here you can see the vein with the valve. This is a good picture right here, the bottom picture. Why is that significant? This bottom picture, what is this telling you about the way veins work? Yes? The muscles have to like push the blood to go, so it has like, it has support because the blood has to flow in one Blood has to flow in one direction. When your muscles shorten, when it contracts and shortens, 
it pushes against the thin walled veins. When those thin walled veins get compressed because of the valves, blood can only squirt in one direction. So it's gonna be squirting in what direction? It's squirting towards your heart. Because arteries carry blood away from your heart and veins carry it towards. Does the blood move in one direction through your heart? Yes. Right atrium, right ventricle, out, pulmonary arteries to your lungs, come back, pulmonary veins, left atrium, left ventricles, out your aorta. It's one direction flow, right? It's not like, oh, I think I'll go this way now. What keeps it moving in one direction? The valves of the heart, good. All right, and we compared um, the different types of systems um, a fish has a single pump, two gills and body. Um, amphibians and most reptiles have a single ventricle. Um, I just saw something in the news last night. A baby was born with a single ventricle. And not only that, let's make it worse, shall we? It was going the opposite direction in its chest. And so they were able to do a heart transplant surgery in order to help that baby survive. But that was one where the development did not take place. Um, here you can see our four-chambered heart. All right, so when we look at the heart, we can look at it like a square and try to remember everything. So let's remember, what is this chamber called here? Right atrium, this is the? What feeds the right atrium? Superior and inferior vena cava. Another name is anterior or posterior vena cava, good. The blood's going to travel from the right atrium down into the right ventricle through what valve? What one? Yes, and you remember that because it spells rat. Good. Okay, it's going to leave the right ventricle and go through what valve? Semilunar. And what semilunar valve? You remember? Where are we headed? Pulmonary. Pulmonary semilunar, right? Okay, up and out. If we go this way, we will be in our pulmonary artery, this direction in the? Right pulmonary. Good. And then when it comes back, oxygenated, okay, this would be the left pulmonary what? And over here would be the? Good, and this is the? Left atrium goes down through the what? And you remember that because it spells? What's another name for that valve? Mitrial valve. Okay, so left atrium, then what's this? Left ventricle. Left ventricle, and then it's gonna go up and out, also through a semilunar, but this time it's called the aortic semilunar valve. <laughs> and then you go out the aorta, yeah? Okay, what do you call, it doesn't show it in this picture, but there's a division between the left and right ventricle. Do you remember what that's called? Septum, oh, Septum. perfect. So you just want to be familiar with the way blood flows and the reason why it flows in those directions. Um, about 70 beats per minute for your heart, depending on if you're resting or ex exercising, the condition that you are in, how large your thoracic cavity is, how much oxygen you have, all of those things can impact that. Okay, we talked about that there's approximately five liters of blood in your body currently, and that's about how much blood moves through your heart every single minute. Heart sounds, light-shirted one. Tell them what you remember about heart sounds. Those are going to slam first when the ventricles are in what, diastole or systole? Yes. Systole. And so when those ventricles are in systole, when they're contracting, they're going to send blood up and out, and they want to send the blood, they you know, would want to send it back into the atria too, right? It's just up and out, anywhere away, so they're under systole. 
What prevents it, the blood from backflowing into the atria are the bicuspid and tricuspid valves, yes? Okay, mm -hmm. but they will go up and out the semilunar valves into the left and right pulmonary arteries and aorta. That will have no problem. But as the ventricles go into diastole, as they relax, they will inadvertently suck blood back in, which will be okay because what doors will slam next? The semilunar valve. So that's the dub. Okay, AV valve, semilunar. AV valve, semilunar. Now, it is also nice during diastole that it's pulling it back in because what else, what does it assist? What does that ventricular diastole assist? Its own filling, right? Because it'll suck blood from the left and right atria into the ventricles. And then when the atria contract, they just finish the job off and get all the blood from the atria into the ventricles. Okay? And you can hear all of those sounds and noises. Um, when you take your pulse, you're feeling an expansion, right, of an artery or a vein? What do you think, an artery or a vein? Artery. 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 You're not going to feel expansion in the vein because in the vein it runs smooth. It's arteries that expand and recoil, expand and recoil. Okay? So that's where you're feeling it. Who controls how fast that beat is that I take when I take my pulse? Who is controlling that ultimately? My medulla oblongata in my brain. Okay? It will send a message. Remember I talked to you about chemoreceptors and detection to CO2, hooks up with water, forming carbonic acid, breaks down into bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. You can lower the pH. That makes your heart beat faster. So ultimately, it's controlled by the medulla oblongata, who sends a message to who? Pacemaker of the heart. That's what's called the pacemaker, but you know the medulla oblongata is really the pacemaker. And it sends that message there. And this causes a wave of, depolar wave of depolarization across the atria. Then they contract in unison. And then that wave of depolarization travels from the SA node into the AV node, bundle of his, Purkinje fibers, which branch around your ventricles, so that your ventricles can contract as one. Atria is one, ventricles is one, they both relax. When the atria is contracting, the ventricles, so when the atria are in systole, the ventricles are in? Diastole. And we remember that because if they stay in diastole, you will die. Then when the ventricles are in diastole, then the atria, I'm sorry, when the ventricles are in systole, then the atria are in what? Diastole. Diastole. If they contract at the same time, what will happen? Nothing good, right? <laughs> Nothing good. If they're just contracting spasmodically, and that's when you need a what? Defibrillator. Clear. <laughs> okay? You need a defibrillator to restart your pacemaker of your heart. Okay? We talked about how you could recognize a healthy heartbeat, beep, 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 as opposed to beep. That, what does that mean? Dead. Dead, flat line. What, what did the P represent? Do you remember? The P waves. Atria, systole, yeah. QRS? Ventricles, systole, and atria, diastole. And then what is T? Ventricles, diastole. Good. And then we talked about how that is bad. Okay. We then had a big discussion about pulmonary and systemic circuit. The thing you want to remember is, let's just take arteries. What can you tell me about arteries in the systemic circuit? What can you tell me about arteries in the systemic circuit? They carry what? Oxygenated blood. But arteries in the pulmonary circuit carry? Mm -hmm. That's right. And so you want to be able to talk about that and be able to make that differentiation. Um, why is the left side of the heart bigger? It's doing the pump to the systemic circuit, right? The left is going to the systemic circuit. The right side of the heart is going to the pulmonary circuit. And that's why we fill our heart on the left side of our body. There are other circuits. What's the circuit of blood just around the heart? Coronary. Coronary circuit. What happens if one of those arteries is blocked? What do I need to have? Bypass surgery. Not every class got to that yesterday because of our funky schedule, okay? But the bypass surgery. 
Um, then we talked about another unique thing, and this is the hepatic portal system. Hepatic portal system. Hepatic means we're talking about the liver, okay? And what we know is that when we eat our food like you're eating right now, and you're digesting it and you're absorbing it, primarily in your small intestines, that all of a sudden your blood sugar, proteins, fats would spike right in the capillaries around your intestine. And if that went back to your heart and to your lungs and to your heart and then your body, that could throw off your dynamic homeostasis. homeostasis. So the blood is immediately shunted via the hepatic portal vein, shunted to your what? Liver. And it'll bring down the level and store that sugar as glycogen. But if the blood is coming in with a less amount of sugar, then what will it do? It'll add sugar to it. So every time it leaves the liver, it's slightly elevated. What if you have no glycogen? Where will it get it from? Fat. Gets it from your fat. Good. All right. And we talked about how this diagram, which is a typical diagram shown in textbooks, you would say, Miss Litton, that is a poor diagram. Why? Yeah, it doesn't have any oxygenated blood going to the liver. So this is a better diagram for that. Okay, real quick. We talked about blood pressure, we talked about veins, we talked about varicose veins. I won't show you. Plasma. Let's talk about, real quick, what's in plasma. We're going to just list them. We're thinking about our road trip. So we have gases, nutrients, proteins, salts, nitrogenous waste. Hormones, vitamins, of course. Good. And then um, I think we're good. The last thing about the capillary exchange, I'm going to get in class to review it one more time. Okay? Um, otherwise, I will see you tomorrow. APers, I believe you have a hyperdoc that's due. Manana, 8 o'clock. Okay. Make good choices. I love you. Have a piece of toast. Absolutely.